and welcome to Real Film Snobs. I'm Brian Michael. And I'm Angela Yeager. Our first movie this week is Little Men, which is a coming-of-age story about a pair of best friends whose friendship is tested uh, when their parents begin to fight over a business issue. And this is the newest film uh, by New York filmmaker Ira Sachs, who has quite a nice little track record uh, going here for him. Ira Sachs' uh, previous film was the much-acclaimed Love is Strange with um, John Lithgow and Alfred Molina. He also did several really great independent films before that that actually I liked even more, Keep the Lights On, uh, which was an exploration um, of a gay romance, and uh, Forty Shades of Blue starring Rip Torn, which is actually a really fantastic film. So he's had like four in a row yeah, that yeah. are very, very good. And this one stars Greg Kinnear as one of the parents. Um, and uh, I believe uh, Jake and Tony, the two young boys in the movie, who are probably you know, supposed to be about 13 years old or so, mm -hmm. um, I believe both of the actors, it's their um, acting debut. So, and they're yeah. quite good. We often talk about ch child actors and how difficult it is to get good authentic performance from child actors and these two are just knock it out of the park this is a very good film it's you know it's very subtle it, you know when i describe that it's about friends you know whose friendship is tested when their parents fight that doesn't sound like the most exciting movie in the world but it's actually you know we saw it in a small group and everyone i think was pretty um, just really kind of blown away by this movie. Yeah, this is a, just a, a beautiful little picture, you know, and I hate saying, you know, a slice of life because I know certain phrases are going to turn some people away but also will, will attract some others. Um, with all the noise of the the summer now kind of gone, now we're kind of getting to the big Oscar push and this is just kind of one of those films in between and um, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this film. This is one of those movies where you kind of want to follow every little character and kind of see, you know, where yeah. they're going. The ending is, is very satisfying without wrapping a bow on everything and it has a conclusion I think that that was very realistic and very telling without telling too much and just kind of showing a little bit there right. especially at the end in the, in the museum and it's just a great great scene um, and uh, we are going to review a, a Greg Kinnear f a picture here in, a, in the, one of our next shows um, but in this one again you know when an actor gets older, um, some lines start to show on their face, and it can be such an asset. And Greg Kinnear has always had a kind of a childish kind of glow, kind of like a Tim Robbins kind of boyish figure or a boyish look. Hmm. And um, <laughs> with those, with the lines on his face now, it just really kind of shows, you know, the smile lines in there and the care. And he just now, when he says a lot of things, you can see there's there's a lot of weight behind those. Mm -hmm. He plays an actor, so it's you know, a big stretch. But um, right. he plays a father in this one, and I really enjoyed both parents. They they all everyone has. The, to deal with this issue with this this business acquisition that they've got because he just in, inherited a, a building and one of the tenants they have to raise the rent. Right. And everybody in this movie has a point of view and has a story. There's no real right or wrong. There's something that has to be done. It's heartbreaking. No one really wants to do it. No one wants to be the bad guy. But then right. also, you know, bad guys kind of define, is d defined differently on each side. And so right. it's just a nice, well-balanced film. It's just one of those circumstances that hits in life that's yeah. really, really tough. And your heart kind of breaks. And there's part of me that, you know, sometimes you can understand why Hollywood movies have a big happy ending where everybody wins because you really want it with these characters because you do like all of the characters. No one's, yeah. no one's a bad guy here, but it's just a tough situation. Right. And, you know, we see movies about gentrification before and it usually is much more black and white. Some, yeah. you know, evil landlord comes in and raises the rent and poor, and, you know, kicks out the poor immigrant family that made the neighborhood what it is. Yeah. And, you know, on the surface, this is sort of what's going on, um, you know, but it's not. It's not. And and so, and the film has sympathy for all the characters and their perspectives and also shows, the, you know, the darker side. Uh, um, the one young man's mother, who's Colombian, who r runs the little dress shop inside the building that they have inherited, um, you know, she's not always the nicest person to them. And she maybe doesn't deal with the situation as well as she could have, you know. Yeah, maybe. when she's kind of pushed, she she bites back a little bit here. Not that they're right. pushing the or shoving pushes, hard. Yeah. yeah, but the way she pushes back yeah. is maybe not so appropriate. So, um, yeah, so I thought that was a really interesting way to deal with that showing that people have their flaws on both sides so yeah and she talked about you know how her, you know her, his father you know just liked me having me there you know we, we were good friends and I knew him actually you know and she you know pretty much says I knew him better than you I was a better friend to him than you were a son to him and then uh, you know in Kinnear's uh, uh, the you know the wife she goes and, and talks to her, you know to the to the business owner and says you know I'm the one who's pretty much the breadwinner I we we aren't this well-off you know wasp family that you think we are we you know I'm actually right. supporting the whole family. So, yeah, I mean, that's what I really like. And then you have the kids, you know, 
uh, played really well. I mean, th this is the, these are great acting. Um, uh, I think they're both debuts, somewhat for anyway for film, and uh, they do a, a great job of it. And I yeah. really like their little stories. They're kind of you know just growing in. They're they're kind of oblivious to kind of what's going on, but they know all of a sudden their parents aren't too happy and they're kind of fighting, but they're still staying their, over their and, yeah. and hanging out, and they don't really know yeah. until you know they get older, then you kind of realize what had happened. And they're but, kind of opposites. I mean, they're very different, but that's what makes them really good friends. You know, one is more of a quiet, artsy. You know, he's you know literally an artist and, and then the other one is more of a braggadocio you know very kind of loud very actor. Brooklyn you know wants to be the next Pacino <laughs> you know and does seem a little bit Pacino-esque in some of his scenes so Might yeah just a lot of fun. To find the film but you got to find it. Yeah, it's, it's definitely it's a, one to Yeah, seek out. it's definitely one of the best of the year. I think the, I think it's a four star film. I th could not find anything wrong with it. Yeah, there were some great it's a very scenes. Very satisfying ending yeah. for sure. So, okay, we will move on then to our next uh, movie, which is a uh, movie you can find online right now, streaming. Uh, I believe probably also on DVD. I'm not sure, but uh, the movie is a documentary from 2016, Weiner, and it explores the embattled former state senator Anthony Weiner, or I'm sorry, st state representative Anthony Weiner, during his 2000. 2013 run for New York mayor and of course um, for anyone who followed the media during that time Anthony Weiner became very famous for having to step down um, you know and he was a very famous politician in New York um, for for do, sexting for you know uh, sending women uh, sexual photos of himself online and uh, through text messages so um, so the movie follows him during the time where he's decided to run for mayor despite this controversy, despite the fact that it's still fairly fresh in the public's mind, but he's trying to make a comeback. He's got his wife, who's a major advisor to Hillary Clinton, by his side. And mm. so, you know, and you're kind of like, what's going to happen next? So, um, so it's pretty interesting. <laughs> And it's, you know, it reminded me a lot, there was a documentary that came out a few years ago about Elliot Friedrich, I think is his name, who's the Attorney General of New York, and it was very much a similar thing where it was this brilliant politician who was taking on the bad guys in this case, you know, in Elliot's case, a lot of the um, the mafia and the corruption in New York. In this case, you know, Anthony Weiner was sort of a, you know, working class, middle class, you know, champion, yeah. really, you know, trying to be out there for the, for the um, you know, for the middle class families and everything, trying to keep New York affordable for people to live and uh, same thing with that documentary where he was brought down by you know a prostitution scandal and in this case it was a different type of sex scandal but still a scandal nonetheless and so it's really sort of heartbreaking to watch these people kind of undone by their own devices this isn't you know I mean the media is awful in this documentary they're not portrayed in a nice way they're just going after whatever they can they don't care about the issues yeah oh, but he sure. also undoes it himself I mean he's yeah. his own worst enemy throughout this there's some there, yeah they're, they're they're pretty brutal on there, but they you know they keep you know asking some of them just keep out why would we want to trust you why should we trust you why should we trust you and I can understand as a journalist you especially you know a political one you'd get tired of these I mean these scandals of course great great make great ink does ink exist anymore uh, make great stories but you probably get a little tired and frustrated by this and some of those probably were bloggers who were just you know voters as well so I could see some of that frustration you know what's really you know what they do a really great job of in this film is really showing what a great politician he is yeah. and I, I understand you know what an oxymoron that, that can be but um, he's so personable he's so energetic he's really they surely go you know show him going out there being very personable being able to answer pretty much any kind of question being able to you know put himself out there and and you know you can't help but like the guy, and you know, and and you know, as you know, with film, you know, when you follow that person, you can't help but kind of want the best for that person. So you're kind of like, okay, come on, get this, get this going. And yeah. I still kind of knew, and I knew there was some other things that had happened. And of yeah. course, during the documentary, an, an, another um, uh, another thing happens, and you can just see the the balloon behind him just deflate, the people behind him just crumble. You can see the frustration in people's faces. Yeah. Uh, we don't get to meet too many of them. We you know see their name and and their title but we also get to you know but we do get to see the look on their faces and how they kind of snip a little bit at him sometimes you can see how everyone uh, especially in a, in a campaign kind of get on each other's nerves right uh, and then of course they concentrate a little bit on her because she is very very high pro very high profile very high profile and so you get to see her reactions and um, right. It's a very interesting film. I really do like the film. I had heard a lot of great reviews about it, you know, going into it, um, but it was still really compelling, and I, I couldn't help my, help myself but just being caught up, going, "Okay, come on," and then remembering, "Oh yeah, that's right. This is this this is there's a reason. Not, yeah, it's not going to end well, is no, it? Damn no, no. 
No, and we're not spoiling anything for anyone out there because you can Google him and yeah. you'll find oh, what there's happened. All, yeah, there's, there's all sorts all of stuff, stuff out there about him. So oh, you could also, um, uh, and then the young lady that he was sexting <clears throat> in the gay world, we just call it texting, by the way. But anyway, uh, you can look up uh, Sydney Leathers. Uh, she became an actress of sorts. And um, very, uh, wow, okay. Well, there's there's always that. And I'm like, well, she there's made a your... career out of the scandal yeah. and other well, people have been known to do that. A so. very short one. Yes. As most people do, you know. When I was a kid, there was scandals. It was just the mistress shot the the wife in the on the in the face on the front front lawn, and, and then that was kind of it. And they went mm -hmm. to jail. Now they get to be a, a movie star or movie star and, and be on videos online. Oof. Nice life. Yeah, it's too bad, Lo. Like you said, because you really do see his charisma. You see him go out and really ad lib. It's not he's not someone who's being managed. I mean, you get the sense of why they're managing him, where they're you know talking about well, how do we want to react to this or that. But he really does a lot of his own kind of spiels when he gets out there and he goes off the cuff a lot and sometimes that gets him into trouble and sometimes it's brilliant. Sometimes when he goes off the cuff it well, works out really well. you can't like him for that because yeah, he does get upset. He does show emotion and it's like, well gosh, you know, in a way, yeah, he loses his temper a little it's bit. It's nice that he's not the usual o uh, robot, exactly. automatron and politician. it's kind of yeah. nice to see that. Someone that, yeah, some people actually say some things that get this goat and he turns around and goes, hey, say that to my face. You're a tough guy now and I was like, you know, in New York and Brooklyn especially, I'm like, yeah, I can see where that would really appeal to people and yeah, that's, yeah, gosh, yeah. darn it. You, do, you can't help but watch the movie and just go and start shaking your head. Someone worst enemy on that one, yeah. Doing? yeah. What are you doing? Guy who had a brilliant political career and basically ruined it, so, yeah. Anyway, oh, I can make really interesting documentary, especially for political junkies, I would say. Yes. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to our, hey, this was just a regular movie? This wasn't a, uh, this wasn't it's a, a his, his classic? Yes, yeah, it's it his distinguished classic. Ah, that's the list I've been together. This is Brothel Number Eight from 1974. Uh, this is a Japanese film. A young a journalist uh, is on the lookout or investigating uh, Brothel Number Eight uh, before World War One. A lot of women were forced into prostitution, and so she wants to find out the some, find some of these women and find their story. And so what she does, she actually does find one of them, kind of follows her home, and kind of befriends her, and just kind of stays as a house guest of this, this woman who was forced into prostitution mm -hmm. and now kind of lives uh, very poor and um, just kind of day by day. And you get to see their relationship just kind of grow together and this, this journalist who feels kind of bad and she has some narration in where she you know feels bad about kind of exploiting this woman and having to ask her questions and how to get around to asking the questions and how do we do this and mm -hmm. the neighbors become very suspicious about this. and. And it's a beautiful looking film. It's a Criterion. We had watched it even on online, and uh, they did a great job of restoring this film. And I was just pulled in. Oh yeah. I mean, we, when we watch movies, we kind of make some comments here back and forth. We certainly did when we watched Wiener. And uh, but this one, yeah, it really pulled me yeah. in. It's a very human story. It's a very tragic story yes. in many it's ways. Really we sad. really get to see how you know what happened to her, you know, and and, and her her life story as it goes along there. Mm -hmm. But we also learn about this journalist as well. And I, I really, I thoroughly enjoyed this film all the way through. I, I can know it's easily amazing. Easily see why this is a classic, but it's one that people have not heard of and really need to seek out. And of course, you know, it's Criterion. So they, so they did go. it again. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's it's very, it, on one hand, it's very beautiful. And on the other hand, the story it tells is so sad at parts. Um, you know, the old woman, there's a scene um, that I don't want to give away too much of, but it's towards the end of the film where, you know, she realizes that the journalist has to leave. She's been staying with her for a really yeah. long time. And this old woman has been very, very lonely for a very long time. And she get, asks to have something of hers to remember her by. And the scene is just heartbreaking. I mean, I got really choked up, actually, when we were watching it. Um, and so I like that. I like the focus on telling women's stories and their role during some of these wars. Um, you know, these women were sent out to the co Japanese colonies, so they weren't even in Japan. They were in places yeah. where people were speaking all different languages, um, you know, Malaysia, different places. They were sent to different colonies, um, you know, to work there and then really discarded by the Japanese people, yeah. you know, not really well regarded when they returned. When they, yeah, so. when they were sold off, they were like, hey, you're helping the family. They didn't really kind of know what they're getting into. They're just, they're going to go work. And then they find out what the work is. Then when they come back, they've they've shamed everyone because they know what they were doing over there. And so now they're right. being even though they were sold, everyone. even though they were sold off when they were yeah. children against and they didn't really their, have a choice. So. Yeah, 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 against their will. It's absolutely heartbreaking when she comes back and seeks out her brother, and then they have the conversation, and it's just. 
Yeah. Oh, it's I just know. it's just absolutely. It's definitely a great film, though. I mean, yeah. I just don't see any way other way to describe it as a as a classic. It just it pulled us in from the minute, right even when we're both tired. You know, sometimes yeah. we're watching these movies late at night, and we're you know, and we both I just you know was totally wrapped They're up. Our cocoa and our blanket and our uh, footsie pajamas. Is that you? No, that's somebody else. Okay. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I, I I was really this has been on my list for. <laughs> For a very long time, boys and girls, and I've been trying to find this one and trying to find this one, and that's the nice right. thing about uh, the Criterion English version as well as is called Internet. Brothel Number Eight, and the uh, Japanese version is called Sandakan Number Eight. Sandakan, yeah. I believe, is the village or the place where we're living sure. overseas. Okay, that sounds good. Okay, okay, so we're gonna take a little detour. Uh, I recently uh, went and saw a lecture by Neil deGrasse Tyson, a very, fa uh, very famous astrophysicist, who actually said he was my personal astrophysicist. I told everybody, but you know, he was talking to me as well. And uh, the first thing I will tell you is that I told all of my coworkers that I was just going to a, a science lecture by an astrophysicist, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, did not explain to them that he, the, he was Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, uh, kind of journey through film. And so what he did is he talked about all of this diff these different um, um, scientific facts uh, through film and also some of the uh, science in films that was less than correct. And so, first of all, my coworkers just think I'm a, I'm a big science nerd and I'm very smart. I fooled them you know, for another few weeks. <laughs> uh, but this was absolutely fantastic. Now, sure, you know, he went go through and show like Back to the Future and show some of the things that, you know, when he knocked over the tree and the, the farm, and then the later on, the, instead of the two, lo the two oak mall, it became the Lone Oak Mall. The little things right, like that. Right, right. But he certainly went into a film like Gravity, which is a great film, my favorite film of that particular year, and explained that, you know, when uh, George Clooney, I'm going to spoil it alerts, George Clooney is being pulled away from Sandra Bullock and he has to let go of the line in order to save her, um, it's space. He's not going anywhere. She's not there. They weren't whipping around. There was no, there was no pull or anything. If he lets go of the line, he actually just stays there. And all she would have to do is just and he would come to her. <laughs> so his sacrifice really was kind of strange. I noticed that when I watched the movie originally. I went, wait, uh, it's okay, it's a movie. Shh. Yeah, yeah. Quiet, quiet, it's a movie. So he would kind of show those things and also explain why right. the science wasn't correct. Right. So it was kind of funny. He's very personable. He does a lot of TV. He does a lot of TV and does a lot of podcasts and stuff. So he's, he's very funny. Did uh, he have any movies? I'm just curious. Did he have any movies that he thought overall, more often than not, got that got the, the science, science right. right. Contact was one of them that he oh, really okay. enjoyed, and he okay. absolutely loved that. Aside from when they would talk a little about science, and then Matthew McConaughey kissed Jodie Foster, which, and now with hindsight, is the funniest thing ever. And of course, they cut away, and the next thing you know, they're they're in bed together, which is pretty much the way the American public wants to see that happen. Uh, but in that scene, before you know they kiss, they talk about the Drake equation, where she explains that you know the possibilities of life in the universe. There's an X amount of or in the equation, there's a Y amount of you know solar systems and planets, and how many of those planets, uh, what percentage, small percentage of those planets would actually have, have sustained life, and how many of them would actually have life, and so mm -hmm. you'd actually have this many that could possibly have life, you know, those type of things. And when he saw the film, and they mentioned the Drake equation, Drake himself was there, not the rapper kids, the, the scientist, and um, and so he tapped him on the shoulder and said, "What the heck? You know, they got they got you know they're a little off on that." And Drake just turned to him and said, "You know, it's just a movie, Neil. Come." Calm down. It's okay. But he would talk about how uh, he wanted to figure out how much Thor's hammer weighed. And don't ask me the name of the Thor hammer because I always get it wrong. And, uh, and so he did the math on that and tweeted it. And then someone actually mentioned that in one of the comic books, they actually just mentioned it says 43 pounds, not the, the weight of 300 uh, elephants. Or something, like 300 billion elephants, or something like that. Oh, okay. So he would just talk about, you know, he, he has the capability when they mention science in a film to to actually be able to figure those out and see if they're right or wrong. Right, right. And so when Superman, of course, uh, in the original film, uh, flies around the planet uh, backwards and makes time go backwards, even I know that's wrong. And when he showed that, he was like, I, um, we're just going to chalk it up to being Superman. <laughs> and apparently Superman can do that. People aren't going to be flying around the planet once it goes the other way or stops. Right, and, right. Yeah. So it was actually kind of fun. It was, it was really, really, really cool. Um, he did talk about some of the backlash that he had when he tweets. If you follow him on Twitter, it's actually pretty funny. When he pokes holes in some films like BB-8 in uh, the new Star Wars movie. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it, because it's a smooth orb, he would actually skid in the sand. He wouldn't really be able to, you know, travel around. And some people right. are, are very people upset. got mad that he was poking yeah. holes in the movies. Yeah. Did in he mention films. anything about Interstellar, a movie you know that I hated? He did. He does enjoy that one because he likes uh, the. Oh, he did the like it. Yeah, the Christopher Nolan one, but he didn't talk too much about the time travel part because that kind of yeah, that's that that. Mm. But uh, yeah, he did. He did mention that one. And he liked that one. He did mention the Expendables. Because apparently at Sylvester some, Stallone. So Sylvester Stallone, at some point in time in the movie, um, at least he's a populist, I guess. Dolph Lundgren uh, writes out one of Einstein's <laughs> formulas uh-huh. um, because Dolph Lundgren um, is a very smart man and was probably bored out of his mind. <laughs> making the movie. <laughs> making the movie and scribbled something down and explained it and it was actually kind of interesting. I, I still will never see the movie though. Um, he talked about in Frozen how in one of the songs uh, she sings about fractals and uh, so that was a uh, fractorals excuse me and so that kind of excited him and you know we talked about fractorals and how they're really strange especially if you go on the internet and you look at the dog fractorals those are really disturbing but okay. yeah so it was just kind of a it was a big big nerd fest really truly is what it was right and people got to ask him questions and you know and and it was very interesting and, and he still enjoys the movies even if the science yeah. isn't wrong because i know that's why he's a pet sometimes he yours. yeah sometimes he does have a little you know sometimes it does bother him but he tries to you know you just try to overcome it but in anyone's you know and in, in any of the you know our viewers out there in their profession when it's shown on a on the screen I especially, you know, you, you see it done wrong, oh, yeah. and it's very, very frustrating. It's and usually so we done all wrong. see that. It's just that he is, you know, really, really, really smart and can explain, you know, uh, Krypton's explosion or, or right. Well, there's like a lot that. of science so, in movies, yeah. especially sci-fi and action. And all exactly. That, so, yeah. Yeah. so it's really interesting, and which is a lot yeah. of fun. And and uh, he's very personable, can explain things in a way that it makes sense. And so if you go on YouTube, there's a lot of well, ones like um, um, everything wrong with that he does. You know, he talks through gravity and explains some things that they get right and they get sure. wrong. And it's, it's a lot of fun, but it was really cool. I had a really good time. Cool. You should have been. You should have been there. So, sorry, I, I missed out. Yes. Yeah. Brian's all sciencey now. Okay, so we'll move on to our last segment, which is uh, her fresh picks. Those are these are my. This is the list I put together. Movies from 2016 that we missed the first time around when they showed in the theater, and uh, this week's pick is *Embrace of the Serpent*, which tells the sor- story of an Amazonian shaman and two scientists he encounters during a span of 40 years, uh, who are searching for a special plant in the rainforest. Um, this is a film by a Colombian director, and it was the first. Colombian film ever uh, nominated for an Oscar. It actually was nominated at last year's uh, Oscars for, um, or I guess this year's technically, earlier this year. This year's for last year. Yes, for best <laughs> foreign language film. If that makes sense, thank you. This year's for last year. Yeah. Uh, mm. foreign language film and just some it never I don't even know if it I don't think it ever showed in Salem that I'm aware of on the th- big screen. And so uh, wanted to see this. I was floored by this movie. I thought it was phenomenal. Uh, beautiful black and white photography, number one. Um, But beyond that, I know the story may not not sound that interesting, but it's actually a really captivating story. Um, It kind of goes back and forth between the 40 years earlier when the shaman's a young man and then the, you know, 40 years later when yeah. things have deteriorated and he's more isolated and he's on, um, he's t- helping this American man who has a kind of a hidden agenda who's saying he's a scientist but may or may not be, um, kind of traverse the, f- traverse the river to find this plant. And I just, I, everything about this movie is so well executed. It's a very young director. It's only like his second or third film. I think he's in his 20s, which is amazing because it's so confident and so assured filmmaking. You would think this is like some very old, wise filmmaker who's been making, you know. Herzog. Herzog is the first person that came to my mind. Yeah, right. Of course, I couldn't think about about Apocalypse Now constantly. I kept hearing the doors in my head. But uh, yeah, this is a beautiful looking film and a very very well told film. First for me, you had to be a little patient with it for in order to kind of see how it was it was planning uh, how it kind of worked itself out um i was very impressed with it i don't know if i'm gonna give it four it just was really 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 close i how could it not be what's there's nothing wrong with it well you know sometimes you just don't it just doesn't have the thing um i don't know um well it's political so you got you know i love it because it's about colonialism but it's about colonialism in a way i've never seen ever portrayed on film before uh, because it's not black or white 
ironically. Um, it's very complicated um, in terms of, you know, these men are out here searching for things. They're taking things from the forest and from the indigenous people. The indigenous people are not portrayed as these very, like, you know, like we usually see in movies, just these very, like, um, stereotypical, either tribal people. You know, they're complicated. They're people. They have yeah. full conversations in the movie, yes. which I really appreciated about And it. some had no interest, and I enjoyed that at first because it was having to have, um, having to, you know, um, have the conversation in order to, to to have it happen, but um, yeah, you know, and I, I liked. So, which one did you like the best? Did you like the the earlier one, or did you like the the the? Well, it's the all newer part of ones? the same story. Yeah. But I thought that. See, I thought that one was a little stronger than the other one. I actually enjoyed the the German. Um, the German. earlier one, yeah, the earlier yeah, no, one a little I think bit better. That's true, because you had the second, the third guy along with them, yeah. and he brought a counterbalance because he was less anti um, the Europeans because he thought, you know, he puts this one, there's a great statement in the film where he's trying to explain why he's so, quote unquote siding with them because the shaman is saying, you're betraying your people to the guy who's acting as the guide for the German. And he says, if we don't, if I don't teach him, this is happening anyway, they're coming anyway. And how yeah. we teach them about us to respect us is going to determine whether we survive or not. Yeah. And I just thought, wow, it was just amazing. It was just, I don't know, it's just the, the different perspectives. But you can you also understand the shaman's perspective of not wanting to have anything to do with these people because they're killing off his people. So Yeah, yeah and this yeah. would be a film, this would this would uh, have been a film we'd never have seen. We would have never have seen this back in the video days. <laughs> this never would have come to town. They would have no, bought no. this. No, this wouldn't have happened. So, again, yes. oh, the Internet isn't the worst thing in the world. Yeah, no, yeah, I do enjoy this. So this was definitely one to, to, to definitely one to check out yeah. uh, for the year. If I'd seen it in time, down. it would have definitely made my best well, of the year. Well, it doesn't. Won't be. Well, don't think it'll make the best. You can't. We use it for this year. I think so. I I'm going to try to use it for fit it in year. there if I can. So anyway, there you go. okay. So we'll wrap up. Little Men. We both highly recommend. Definitely. Brian says one of the best of the year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Wiener. We both recommend. Are you giving that three and a half or four stars? You can't even go there. Okay. Uh, we had Brothel number eight as uh, his distinguished classic, also a, a great classic, an embrace of the serpent, uh, which I say is a classic. Um, you can check us out on our website at realfilmsnobs.com. You can follow us on Twitter or like us on Facebook. As always, I'd like to thank our wonderful sponsors and our fabulous crew and my delightful co-host. Aww. Aww. Uh, that's all for this week. Have a great day and great movies. Thank you.